Hi, this is Katherine Skinner of the Educopia Institute. This workshop recording and all of its accompanying material is openly and freely available as part of a research project undertaken by Educopia Institute with Carnegie Mellon University, Colorado State University, Indiana State University, the Morehouse School of Medicine, Oregon State University, Penn State University, Purdue University, the University of Louisville, University of North Texas, University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and Virginia Tech University. It has been generously funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. This workshop has been designed to, to provide you with resources and tools to help you to know how to handle file format decisions as a researcher, particularly regarding your research outputs. This workshop is part of a six workshop series on topics related to the preservation and curation of research data and complex digital objects. And you can access the workshops and all of their accompanying materials, including the slides, uh, guidance briefs, and handouts at https educopia.org slash research slash etd plus as you see on your screen. So where and how you store your research materials and writings is going to help to determine how long they survive. In the pre-digital environment, storage was somewhat easier. Students produced a thesis or a dissertation that was a written document, usually text-based. They typed it up, the institution reviewed it, and then shelved it or else put it on microfiche for posterity. Now, instead of that physical document, you are going to be turning in a set of files. And those files have lots of dependencies, software, and hardware, they won't work in six years, let alone in 60, if they're just stuck on a shelf. Think about all the threats to digital content, from file corruption to viruses, environmental disasters to theft, and from storage device malfunctions to accidental or malicious deletions. Storage matters, it matters a lot. And you need good strategies and approaches in order to make sure the content that you create stays viable. So the purpose of this workshop is to provide you with the resources and tools you need in order to store your research outputs safely and securely. So what should you know by the time we finish? First, you should understand the range of threats to storage stability in the digital environments you're using for your research outputs. You should also know how to weigh the pros and cons of different approaches to research content storage. And you should gain familiarity with storage fundamentals, including the current and emerging storage options for digital research outputs. So why does it matter to store content in lots of locations? Ultimately, where and how you store your research materials and writings, that's gonna determine how long they survive. And the risks to your digital files are many and they are varied. They go from file corruption to viruses, from environmental disasters to theft, and from storage device malfunctions to accidental or malicious deletions. So you need to mindfully plan, choose, and document where you're storing your digital materials. And by doing this, you can make sure that you and others will have access to them in the future. So there are different levels of protection that you can afford for your content. And here, we're mostly going to focus on good backup routines, plus a bit of planning around where and how you store that content. So what is a backup? Backup practices might include things like copying your files to a departmental or a university-based storage network, or copying your files to an external hard drive or solid state media, like a thumb drive, or copying your files to a third-party storage solution like Google or iCloud or others. So the backup process does not need to be arduous or complicated. Ultimately, all you need to do is make sure you're making copies of your digital content and storing those in different locations from the original. And you usually do this in order to prevent data loss. So what are some of the most common storage options that you're gonna encounter and hopefully have access to in your own work? You can take simple steps now within those, uh, that range of, of uh, storage devices in order to create a systematic storage process whereby you're making multiple copies and storing them in geographically dispersed locations. And that's going to secure your content against a wide range of mishaps and of disaster scenarios. So what might that look like? So let's start with your storage options themselves. And you do ha likely have a lot already. So some of those might include your laptop or your desktop. 
This might be your primary work location and or where you are saving your documents and your files as you work on them, either on a computer's hard drive or internal flash storage, like a spinning disk or a solid state drive. Now, you may also have external hard drives, whether those are spinning or solid state. You may use these in order to back up the files of, of whatever it is that you're creating and need to store. And ideally, if you are using external hard drives, this is going to be a dedicated drive that's not used for any other purpose and that stays in one location. Now, you may also be using flash drives and other solid state media, um, memory cards, thumb drives, to store a variety of your research outputs, including your multimedia files and your data sets. These are inexpensive, they're easily obtainable, and they're portable, all of which are reasons why we use them so much right now. And then finally, you may be using the cloud. You may be using lots of different quote unquote clouds, which is really just server farms. So when, when you do this, it means that you're putting your files in a server that's managed by some third party that you're able to access by the internet. So cloud environments include a broad range of options right now, including solutions that your own academic institution may offer or services that may be offered by for-profit companies or even by not-for-profit companies. So some of the for-profits are Google with Google Drive, Amazon S3, Flickr, YouTube, Dropbox, Apple iCloud, um, the list goes on and on. So what are some of the recommendations that we can make uh, they begin with having multiple copies stored in multiple places can help to offset your risk of loss. So you always want to make sure that you have one copy of each important file to you that is under your own physical control. So in other words, not in a cloud environment. Otherwise, you're relying entirely on internet connectivity to get to your files, which is something you just can't depend upon in all circumstances. Note that Google Drive, Dropbox, iCloud, et cetera, are all cloud-based environments. Now, you also want to make sure that you have at least three complete copies of your research content stored in different places. So you might have one copy of each stored on your local drive of your own computer, another on an external drive, and another in Dropbox or on your university server. And then finally, you'll want to make sure at least one of those copies is stored in a geographically different location than the others. So if you have one in the cloud, that does count as long as the server on which the content is stored is not physically in your location. There are a number of software packages that are designed to ensure that you don't lose your content, including changes that you make to it intentionally over time. One of the easiest of those is called the Time Capsule Package, which takes snapshots of all the files on your computer at particular moments as you designate. You can have a time capsule run all the time, capturing incremental changes as they happen, or you can plug it in weekly. And these are usually done through uh, uh, external hard drive and you can purchase these almost anywhere. You can certainly purchase them at Amazon. You can also go to Office Depot or you know, name your store. Um, you will find these at Target. You will find these all over the place. When you have a time capsule, one of the benefits is that it provides a history of your research outputs. So figuratively, it gives you a way to return to different moments in time to access your research outputs as they existed at that time. Now, I do want to differentiate between backups, which is what we've been talking about so far, and preservation as a practice. So preservation has been defined uh, fairly briefly here as follows. It's the series of managed activities that are necessary to ensure continued access to digital materials for as long as necessary. So the most important words here are managed activities, continued access, and as long as necessary. So what might managed activities look like? So some of those managed activities include things like producing and maintaining an inventory of your content so that you're documenting your file names, your sizes, your locations, the types, and even the checksums if possible. So checksums can be generated by several open source tools and utilities and they can be stored in your inventory. And basically what a checksum is, is it's a number that serves kind of like a digital fingerprint or a digital signature for a file. It's generated against an algorithm, a mathematical equation that's run against that file, 
And no matter how many times you run that same algorithm against a particular file, it's always going to give you the same number. And if anything in the file changes, whether accidentally or on purpose or maliciously, the checksum will also change. And so what that means is if you compare two checksums that are generated at different moments in time against the same file, that will tell you whether your file has changed or not. And one of my favorite tools, and you know, it, it has been out there for a number of years now, uh, that, that does this, this kind of fixity check um, is named Fixity, and it's by AV Preserve, and it runs checksums on files, on folders, and on directories as you specify. It does this as, at regular intervals, again, as you specify, and if the same file results in two different checksums over time, the Fixity tool will actually send you an email alert that tells you where the problem has been detected, and that allows you to identify quickly if something has gone awry with a research file. So names matter, particularly in binary code. They give you a way of knowing what it is that you have stored on a device. So there's not much point in storing content if you're not doing so in a way that enables you to locate it and use it in the future. And with that in mind, we have a few recommendations on how you can use naming conventions to, make, to help you make sure that your stored content is gonna be understandable in the future. One of those is to systematize your folder and file name conventions and do that using human identifiable information. So this helps to ensure that wherever you may store your content, you're gonna be able to know what it is. So for example, if in 1999 you stored your content on CDs and now you have a box of unmarked CDs, if you've uh, named everything, if you've used a naming convention that is human understandable, so for example, maybe music of social change dot doc, rather than ones that have no inherent meaning like paper.doc or even you know the year and the date.doc, you're going to have a much better chance of finding what it is that you've stored. Now you can also use naming conventions to mark different versions of a file. So for example, you can use consecutive numbers to track a file through all of the edits and revisions that take place to it. So instead of just music of social change.txt, maybe it would be music of social change dash v12.txt. That would let you quickly sort through a set of files to find the version that you're looking for. Now, another thing to be careful about in, in your management of your files is you wanna make sure that your file names are always followed by the correct file extension. So if it's a text file, it should say txt or .doc or .docx. Um, if it's a comma separated values file, it should say .csv. And basically what this is doing is it's giving both you and your computer signals regarding what software package can be used to open the file. And finally, avoid using special characters in all file and folder names. So the ones that are listed here on the slide are a good example. These, these types of special characters make a file very difficult for a computer to deal with, particularly in some storage environments. So I wanna leave you with a couple of key uh, resources and I wanna give a nod to the guidance brief that you'll find in the same location where you found this webinar um, or on that second slide of this presentation that https uh, colon slash slash educopia.org slash research slash etd plus all one word. Um, there you will find many, many more resources so that this webinar is really intended to be more of a jumping off point than an end point. But two key resources that may help you both understand what backing up is all about and preservation is all about um, and also will help you to understand some of the best practices that you can put into practice yourself. There's an article on Tech Republic that we have listed here, and then there's a fantastic resource that's maintained by uh, the, the Library of Congress and the National Digital Stewardship uh, uh, Coalition that is the personal digital archiving uh, space. So under digitalpreservation.gov slash personal archiving. I'll also leave you with a slide that gives you a quick re revamp of everything that we've just gone through. And uh, the three main issues that I hope you are familiar with at this point. So one of those is that where and how you choose to store your research materials and your writings is going to determine how long they survive. 
A second is that you should have at least three copies of every file that's intrinsically linked to your thesis and dissertation research, and that you should be storing those copies in at least two different locations. So that might be on a local drive, an external drive, a campus-based server, a cloud-based server, or other environments. So I wish you the best of luck, and thanks so much for listening.